We're going to start a new series. It's called Letters from Papa Paul. And this is going to be the introduction. We're starting tonight on the introduction. And uh, this is where I get this title. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. And he says, Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. So Paul basically says, listen, I'm, I'm your dad. This is the, what the, the ministry of the apostle is about. <clears throat> the ministry of the apostle is more of a fathering type ministry. It's a mentoring thing, and it's, uh, I like to say he is, uh, he's like the, the GC. He, he kind of works together with everybody. I'm not doing a five-fold ministry teaching right now, but this is how I always remember the five-fold ministry. You've got the apostle, you've got the prophet. So the apostle is the one that can touch all the other fingers. You've got the prophet, because the prophet's always pointing out stuff. You've got the evangelist, because that's the one that goes the furthest. You've got the pastor, because that's the only finger that's got an art that goes straight to the heart. And then you've got the teacher, which does all the probing. Well, he is an apostle, and so he has become their father. So when you, when you birth a ministry, when you birth uh, in a, a, a church, then uh, you kind of are invested in him. And he was only there about a year and a half Then he, because he put people in place because that's what Paul did. He went, he started churches, kind of started with the Jews, and then, and we'll talk later about how he got the Gentiles involved. And then uh, always had, he raised people up, uh, and most of them were new converts. And so he taught them and raised them up. And so uh, then about a year and a half, then he moved on, went to Ephesus. And so... That's what he does. He goes and plants churches and starts churches, births them, so he's their father. So this is a letter. These first and second Corinthians are letters, which all of his epistles are just letters to churches, and he's, handle, he's basically handling issues and things like that. The, uh, importance, the importance of studying Corinthians, uh, is, it's a relevant study for today in, several, in a couple of different ways. Uh, first, it is written to a church in an urban setting that was a bustling hub of worldwide commerce. They were living in a degraded culture and it was, they had idolatrous religions. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Mm -hmm. So it's, relative, it's relevant to us today. Yeah. Uh, secondly, the questions that were being asked and the problems that were being faced by the Corinthian church are the same as those for the churches of today. I don't know why we don't move past the same issues, but we, don't, we keep having the same issues. And so uh, that's why this study is relevant to us, because he's addressing some things that uh, needed to be handled, the questions they were asking, and that sort of thing. So he wrote this in about A.D., uh, let's, let's move on, he wrote this about A.D. 56, in the late winter of uh, 56 A.D., and we'll, we'll talk about the founding of the church later. And so this, this is about, little, about six years after he started the church, and he was writing from Ephesus. He was in Ephesus when he was writing this letter. And we don't have the benefit of having the letters that they sent him, so we only have the response. And so uh, we can kind of glean what he was saying, but some of the things. But I want to give you a little bit of background about the city of Corinth. This is an interesting city because Corinth, I'll see if I can get my black, my little laser pointer going. It don't work on the screen. Okay. Well, you see where Corinth is, that big black dot. There's a real narrow spot there in that isthmus, and that isthmus atta uh, attaches the Peloponnese to the rest of the mainland of Greece. So this is all Greece. Uh, it's called Acacia. Uh, no, Achaia, Achaia. And so they were right there at that narrow spot. And so there was ships coming in the Corinthian Gulf and ships coming in the Sar Saronic Gulf. And so they were a port city on two different ports. And in fact, some small ships, they would actually use logs and roll them across, <clears throat> across that narrow place. They couldn't do the big ones. And in fact, Nero tried to, to build a canal in there but it didn't happen until the 1800s. It actually was a canal built there. So, um, so they were a port city. So they had people from all over the world. They were the least Greek of the Greek cities and the least Roman of the Roman cities. So they were Roman and Greek. And so they were a very, uh, there's a wide variety of people. In fact, uh, 
the, the, they're located in that narrow stretch of land, and it's about 48 miles west of Athens. Now, its history goes back at least as far as 900 B.C. Now, the myth is, the Greek myth states that the city was founded by Corinthos, a descendant of the sun god Helios. But starting in the 5th century B.C., the advantageous location of Corinth on an isthmus soon made it a very wealthy city. Its three excellent harbors, harbors made it ideal to handle commercial traffic on both the western and the eastern seas, and its riches eventually rivaled those of Athens. And after fighting a few wars over the years, the Corinth city-state was controlled by Alexander the Great in 332 B.C. This is a history lesson, y'all. There's a reason why I'm talking. The city was destroyed by the Romans in the Battle of 146 B.C. and was rebuilt about a century later under Roman Corinth. Under the Romans, Corinth became the seat of government for the southern Greece or Achaia. So at its peak, Corinth was not only known for its riches, but also for its painters and its architecture. How many have ever heard of Corinthian columns? So like, you know, your plantations and all those, stuff, those big white columns that have the capitals on them, that have all the leaves and stuff, those were designed in Corinth. Through those, so we still use those, building the columns that created the Corinthian style and the ornate and the ancient world. So they were actually, this was the Vegas of the first century. So you get that in your mind. Corinth was the Vegas. So Paul started a church in basically Vegas of the first century. Now I like that because you just go right into the middle of where the darkness is and start a fire, start a light. And so that's what I like about it. Uh, sadly, Corinth was also known for its vices. Immorality and sexual sins were rampant, in part due to a pagan temple within the city limits that was dedicated to the pagan goddess Venus. And it was, in the, it was dedicated to lust. The temple's illicit services employed more than 1,000 women as prostitutes, who the temple called them priestesses. So they had temple prostitutes. So that, was, that tells you how the morals of the city were. When you went to worship, that's what you did. Uh, Corinthians were also polytheists. In other words, they had multiple gods. And we, we'll talk about that later on in chapter 13. Paul addresses that. So they had multiple gods, but the main one was Venus. And so uh, you know, <clears throat> we think we started the, rep the sexual revolution in the 60s, in the mid-20th centuries. Well, the question today in the, the 21st century of how to be faithful to God in a permissive society was an issue during the first century. So we're still asking the same question, how can we be faithful to God in such a permissive society? And so we're dealing with some of the same issues that we dealt with before. So, Paul, during his second missionary journey in the summer of AD 50, 50 AD, the Apostle Paul leaves Athens and travels to the city, 48 miles to the west. In it, he meets Priscilla and Aquila, a couple who will greatly aid him in his ministry. When they discover Paul is a tent maker like themselves, they let him stay in their home. Now, this is something interesting I found out because I've always thought he's a tent maker. Well, I'd always thought big tents, you know, whatever tents, but he made tents out of goat hides, and so he was a leather worker, but they made little small pup tents out of them for, for people that were travelers, people, you know, that were um, like Bedouins and people like that that were, that were nomadic. And so they made, and so these, Priscilla and Aquila, were apparently already believers, and he met them there, and so I, I, the Bible doesn't indicate he already knew they were there, he just met them there, and I think it's interesting how God provided some people for, God, for Paul to work with when he went into this place to start a church. He had a heart for it. He had a call for it. Um, he went into it, and then Priscilla and Aquila were there. They also had the same occupation, and so they actually traveled with Paul later on some of his journeys and helped him start other churches, and they made tents as they went. That's how they paid their way. That's how they made their living, and they did that. Uh, Paul's friends and fellow evangelists Silas and Timothy join him in Corinth, and so he preaches the gospel every Sabbath until he leaves the city around the autumn of uh, 52 A.D. Now Paul will revisit it later in 58 A.D. during his third missionary journey, but he writes at least two letters to the church in the city in the late winter of 56 and the other, another in the late summer of 57. So Paul starts it in 50, leaves like in the autumn of 52, and then, so he's writing this in 56. So these 
people he's writing to, some of them are not even five, four, five, four years old in the in the in the the faith. Thank you, Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost has helped me talk over here. So they're 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 fairly new converts, but Paul. So Paul's having to deal deal with some things that that you know an established church you don't have those issues technically, but uh, because of their their culture and because of where they come from, they start into integrating a lot of their culture from where they came from into it. And so that's why Paul had to uh, handle some of these issues. Now, the survey, this is kind of, the, there's three main uh, parts of Corinthians. The first part, he's answering uh, Chloe's report of division. So he gets an, a letter from Chloe, from her family, his family, her family, it doesn't say he has to see her, talking about there's division. And so he answers those. And then he answers the report of fornication in, in like the, the first, you know, so you got the first third, kind of the middle there, and then he goes to answering the letters of questions. So they have questions that they're asking, and so he'll handle. That's how the book of 1 Corinthians is broken down. So um, he's dealing with all these issues. He's the papa. He's got to deal with all this other stuff. So, you know, when you're the daddy and things get out of hand, you've got to, you got to do it. Now stay with me on this, on this point, okay? Stay with me on this point. He wrote letters, not laws. He wrote letters, not laws. So every epistle was a letter written to a specific church for specific issues and instances. If Paul had meant for them to apply to every church, he would have covered and copied, he would CC to everybody. Every church. So he'd say, hey, I'm going to write this letter. Let's send this out to everybody. He handled specific issues to specific cultures, specific instances. But we've started making doctrine out of his handling of these very specific issues. And this was never meant to be the case. We are to look to Jesus and rely on the Holy Spirit for guidance. Since so many of the issues faced by the early church still exist today, these, the things discussed can be guideposts. And there are principles that are in these letters that we can use. They are not hard and fast rules, though. Humans are always, as humans, we're always looking for an easy way out. In other words, if we can say, you know, okay, let's just make a, a rule about that, and so we don't have to think about it again. Jesus didn't do that. If you notice, and look at every miracle Jesus did, every miracle, except for one instance, instance where he healed two blind people at the same time, he did the miracle differently for everybody. He did it differently. To, for some blind people, he just touched their eyes. Some he spit on the ground, made mud, and put in their eyes. Some, I mean, he just handled every one of them differently. What he did was, and this is a, a study that I'd like to get into at some point, in 3 John where it talks about, Beloved, I wish that you would prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. He was handling soul issues because when, you know, when you're a blind beggar, you've got some some self-esteem issues, or if you're a leper, you know, the whole point was you don't touch lepers. And so what does Jesus do? He touches them. He's addressing that soul issue, that thing, that, that rejection that they're dealing with. He could have, because if you look at, and I'm getting on that teaching, but I'm just going to try to do this here. The centurion, the, the Roman centurion that, asked, that told Jesus he, his servant was sick, he said, I'm, I'm under authority. I know that you, I know about authority because I'm under authority. He said, all you have to do is say the word and he'll be healed. And Jesus said, I've not seen so much faith in all of Israel. And he said the word. So all he ever has to do for healing is say the word. He don't have to do anything else. But if you notice, he always does something in the healing process. But what do we do is we have something work for us one time that's going to, I mean, if I would have made mud and put it somebody's eye, I'm going in the mud making business to heal people's eyes. Everybody that's blind, I'm going to put mud in their eyes. Well, that's not how everybody needs to be handled. That's not how God handles everybody. He deals with us individually. He made us individually, and he deals with us individually. So that point being is when Paul is handling these issues, he's handling these in a way that he feels led by the Spirit to handle them. They're not necessarily hard and fast rules. They're not laws that we are to, to set up. Now, People, now, you're going to have to stay with me on this, okay? Just kind of hear me out before you start making any, any, saying anything. 
So people said the argument is that Paul told Timothy, he said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Okay, when did he write that? When he wrote that, the New Testament didn't even exist. The scripture that existed was the Old Testament, was the Torah, which is the first, uh, first five books of the Bible. There was the prophets. In fact, the, uh, the, the New Testament hadn't been canonized yet until later on, decades later. The scripture he was referring to was the Torah or the Pentateuch, the five books, penta meaning five. This is the writings of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Second was the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, you know. Your Elijah, your pro all the prophets, major and minor. The last of the three divisions was a Ketuvim, which is, contains all the poetry books. So it's the theology and drama and Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther. So those three things, that's all they had. Jesus, when he quoted scripture, he quoted Old Testament, he quoted Deuteronomy, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's quoting Deuteronomy. So when Paul said all scripture is given, he was talking about these scriptures, the, what they had at the time. He was not talking about the New Testament. In the New Testament, these letters, these epistles, their epistle means a writing or a letter, these were to specific instances. So what the thing is, is Jesus wants us to understand, he doesn't want us to live by laws and by rules, he wants us to live by relationship. So there's going to be things that you handle in one way, in one instance, that you're going to have to handle differently in another instance because you're going to have to follow because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us we have access to his guidance and to his leading and so if we just had if everything was a law because Jesus said I didn't come to do away with the law but to fulfill it in other words so everything that was missing everything that was was deficient in the law Jesus completed it made it perfect and he said so now my, my commandment is that you love one another this is my commandment, that you love one another. And when the, the religious leaders came to him and said, what are the greatest commandments? He just made two. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. If you look at the Ten Commandments, they're, they're, the first four are love, your God, love the God with all your heart. The first four apply to that. The last six apply to love your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to murder him. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to get to take his wife. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to covet after his stuff. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to bear false witness against them. So Jesus said, these are the two laws. So what he's saying is, look at those filters. Whenever you're, when something in your life, you're, you've got a decision to make, something you come across, look at, is it still, is it honoring God and is it honoring my neighbor? And say, so we've, we've put too many laws and rules in place, especially as Pentecostals. We love a lot of rules. We love, I mean, I grew up Bishop will tell you when he grew up, if you're grinning, you're sinning. And so I grew up with all these rules and all these things. And so we felt like we were, uh, and I, I believe that it was, it was for a season. It was for where we were coming from as a culture where when you got saved out of certain things that you had to go to an extreme. And I had to do that myself when I was going through, when God told me back uh, when I turned 40, he said, I want you to give yourself to, to, to doctrine and to teaching and that sort of thing. Basically, I want you to dive into the Word. And I felt the Spirit lead me to, I, I was only to listen to Christian music. I was only to watch Christian television. That's all those things. But if you know me, I love every style of music. But I had to, at that point in time, for a starting point, I had to limit myself. I had to put hard and fast rules in place. And I had to say, okay, because of this time in my life, I had to focus. Now, I didn't like Christian television that much because, honestly, it was TBN and Paul and Jan. And, I mean, God bless them. They, deal, they did work. They do great work. TBN's still going on. But, you know, I'm not into gaudy. I don't like gaudy. But, you know, it's just, it was all the same stuff. It was all the same thing. But that's all I could watch. If I watched TV, that's what I felt the, the Lord tell me to do. And so I had to do that. But see, then as I got uh, to a more mature place, he gave me more freedom. I could start listening to my other styles of music. Uh, I love jazz. Jazz is one of my favorite styles of music. I love jazz. 
Uh, I love country music. I love, I grew up on the 70s. I love 70s music. I'm a child of the disco. I like disco music. I like that stuff. I like anything that's got a groove. Anything's got a, I'm a, I'm a disco child, so I, anything's got a groove, I like it. I like, I like classical music. I like all kinds of stuff. Not a big rap fan, but it's okay. It's, it's just, you know, it's just a different type of poetry to music. And so, um, I mean, it is. That's all it is. It's, they're, they're just rhyming. They're saying things. It's just that what they're saying is just you don't need to be hearing it, but um, it's just a new iteration of talking to music. So God did that, and so I believe that's what God has done with the church. He took us through a place to where because of the way the culture was, he, we had to go through these hard places, these tight places. In other words, these, we had to be so so legalistic that we had to do these things but then as we mature then we have this ability that we can go uh, t we can kind of branch out we can kind of we have some freedoms we have some liberty in fact Paul uh, will talk about later on in Corinthians talk about liberties not letting your freedoms cause somebody else to stumble he said you can do whatever you want to do as long as you you know long as the, the spirit doesn't you know tell you not to do it, you can do it, but if it's going to cause someone else to stumble, that's when it becomes uh, a detriment to somebody else. And that com comes to the, to the love your neighbor as yourself thing. So it goes by those rules, those, those two commandments. And so it's a filter. Those commandments are filters. They're not hard and fast rules. And that's why we don't have necessarily the Ten Commandments anymore. We have these filters to use because all those commandments were based on those two, but back then the way they came where they came from because they'd been slaves in a in a heathen culture for so long they had a slave mentality they'd been used to being told what to do and so when they came out of that God had to just tell them what to do for him but then as they grew as you see in the New Testament then freedom became came around and so that's why I was talking to my mother-in-law one time she was at our house and she had uh, kind of started wearing some sweatpants around the house because she got cold and uh, but that's you know she didn't wear it but then she got to where she started wearing slacks and stuff and she's cute she's so cute she's so funny but she so she sat down with me and my my you'll you'll learn this my nickname in the family is Bubba so you know if my sister's here and she accidentally says Bubba then you'll understand so she says Bubba were we wrong back then that you know, we couldn't wear pants, and I said, well, no, Mom, I don't think you were wrong. I think you're held to the highest and the best that you know, the revelation that you know. But the Scripture says there is revelation hid for later, for generations to come. And so we have to be able to go into these, these areas and not limit what God has called us to do. We can just unplug the power cord, baby. Never mind. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, so anyway, so he didn't write laws, he's writing letters to his kids. He's saying, okay, this is what you're doing. And so, you know, if you get into Timothy, if you get into Timothy where it talks about women being silent in church, y'all don't like that. <laughs> but see, he was dealing with an instance where there, the, because see those ladies, and this is not even in the, but I'm just trying to lay some groundwork here before we get into the scripture. There because in that culture, in that culture, women were not taught, were not taught anything. They weren't educated. In fact, one of the rabbis from that day said, I'd rather burn the Torah than see a woman be taught the Torah. That's the, that's the values that they had back. That was the culture. And so what was happening was Jesus embraced women because they were a major part of his ministry. I mean, women were the first people at the tomb on Easter Sunday. They're the first one to proclaim he was alive. Yes, that's right. Come on, somebody. Amen. I mean, Amen. in our tradition, in the Pentecostal renewal, the first person filled with the Holy Ghost in the early days was a woman. Mm -hmm. Come on. So anyway, so he was dealing with those women. They were, ask, they were, they were sitting on opposite sides of the church, and what would happen was the, the, somebody would say something, and they would have a question about it. They'd holler over at their husband and ask him a question. Ask him, what if, well, what does he mean by that? Was it? And so basically he's saying, okay, y'all going to have to be quiet and just while you're in church and then ask him afterwards. So it's not, you know, now speak, you know. So we took it and we took it, okay, women can't teach anybody. They can teach the kids, but they can't teach no men. Lord, I, you can learn something from a woman. I mean, you can learn something from women. They're more typically they're more intuitive than men are. Uh, that's not the case in my, in my case. 
I was listening to a podcast one day and the preacher was describing men and women. He talked, he talked about men. He said, you know, they're just a very very narrow mind, narrow, narrow focus. They got a one track mind and they're this, that, and the other. And women, they're just, they're just really observant. They're really all this. They're talk, talking about all these things. And I said, oh my Lord, I'm a woman. Because <laughs> I'm just, I'm very observant. I'm very, I learned from the best. My mother, she, she will be here next weekend, not the Easter weekend. She'll be here next weekend for my birthday. So she'll, she wants to, she's going to come to church. I learned from her because my mother is curious. She's not nosy. She's curious. And so she'll sit in a restaurant and she'll say, she's listening to three different conversations at one time. She's listening to what we're saying, she's listening to the people over there, and she's listening to people over there, and she's doing all this. See, I taught Sharon how to do it. She's not a master at it yet because she'll be going. But see, that's, I mean, that's the thing about it. So we, we have, that's why, that's why God made us man and woman because there are things that are deficient in one that are not deficient in other and vice versa. So anyway, that was... So it's the context. We always have to consider the context and the culture that they're addressing. So let's get to Paul actually planting the church. So he planted the church in A.D. 50, and we read in Acts chapter 18. I'm just going to read the scripture, verses 1 through 17. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. And this is Paul starting the church, planting the church. Just a second. It says, then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Remember, it's 48 miles west. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife, Priscilla. I think that was just interesting that they'd just recently shown up. And Paul, show, and they showed up at the same place at the same time. Uh, they had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. I could, just, I could talk about everything. They thought they were just leaving because they had to leave, and they were going because God had a purpose for them. So sometimes you think you're doing something because you just have to, but God is actually working all things together for good to them that love the Lord and they're called according to his purpose, Romans 8. So Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue, trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. After Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all of his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. And I highlighted this. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, Your blood is on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I'll go preach to the Gentiles. And we say, Thank you, Jesus. Because if, if that accepted it, we wouldn't be in right now. Then he left and went to the home of Titius, Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. But when Gallio became governor of Achaia, some Jews rose up together against Paul and brought him before the governor for judgment. They accused Paul of persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to our law. Yes. But just as Paul started to make his defense, Gallio turned to Paul's accusers and said, Listen, you Jews, if this were a case involving some wrongdoing or serious crime, I would, have a reason, I would have a reason to accept your case, but since it's merely a question of words and names and your Jewish law, take care of it yourselves. I refuse to judge such matters. And he threw them out of the courtroom. The crowd then grabbed Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him right there in the courtroom, but Gallio paid no attention. I found it interesting that Sosthenes was a ruler. He was a ruler in the Jewish synagogue at Corinth, and he was an opponent before Paul came. He was an opponent to Christianity, but now he's being beaten because he now believes. In fact, you'll see when we get to chapter 1, you'll see that Paul mentions him by name in the very first verse. Sosthenes was the Jewish synagogue leader, and Paul then, 
he became a convert. So, so Paul is trying to work with these believers. You know, and a lot of times when we, when I grew up, a lot of times our thing was, that, well, if you just get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, then you won't do anything wrong. I mean, I've heard people say that. You know, people make, will say something or do something. I mean, my, my sweet little mother-in-law said that one time. You know, we talked about somebody doing something. She said, well, I thought they were saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I said, well, Mom, they're still human. They still have the human flesh part of them. And so we understand that there are issues that Paul is going to address that are because of these fleshly things, because of uh, misunderstandings, because they're trying to incorporate some of their culture from outside, some of the things that they've grown up with, some of the things they knew, because, you know, it was, it was familiar. They didn't know how to handle situations and circumstances, and apparently Paul had to really get involved because the leaders he left there weren't able to handle it, so he still had to come in, and that's why, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's like why Bishop had to come here, because, you know, you guys needed, some, needed somebody to give some direction, and so, but uh, here I am. <laughs> So, you know, it's just like one of these things, sometimes when you're the leader, you have to do some things and you have to address some issues. And you'll see, he gets hardcore. We'll start next week on chapter one, but he gets hardcore about some of these issues, especially the fornication. He'll get hardcore about that. And it's things that, it's ways of handling things. And a lot of people think, well, you know, um, because a lot of leaders are just really kind, really you know, gentle and stuff like that, and, and you're, we're supposed to be that way, you know? We're supposed to be kind, we're supposed to be gentle, uh, we're shepherds. But sometimes, you know, David, David was a shepherd, and, but then all of a sudden uh, a, a lion shows up trying to eat the sheep. Well, he's responsible for those sheep, so he had to get violent. I mean, he... Threw his, he did the sling, and the, the thing started coming at him. He said, all right, it's on. And he grabbed it, ripped it open. I'm, I'd like to see that. Because apparently David was a little small guy, but that lion turned on him. He said, all right, here we go. And he just grabs him and rips him, takes his jaws and rips him open. And then a bear does the same thing. Because he tells Saul, he said, listen, the lion came and tried to take my dad. So I killed him. I ripped him apart. The bear came and they tried to attack me. I ripped him apart. I'm thinking, dude, the Holy Ghost came on him big time. <laughs> I mean, he had some Superman, superpowers thing from the Holy Ghost come on him because he was worshiping the whole time. The whole time he's out there fighting with the sheep, he's worshiping. That's right. Oh, come on now. Mm -hmm. That's the power of worship. When you are worshiping, when you have a heart of worship, when you're, uh, and I'm not talking about just, just, listening to music. I'm talking about when you enter into worship. Yes. Now this is my heart. I can, I'll talk about worship any day. But when you enter into worship, there is a, an aspect. So it's like this. So we stay, we have, we're in our own shell a lot of the times because we're wrapped up with our own problems. And, and a lot of people think, well, God is just this egomaniac, needs people to aff affirm him, stuff like that. So, you know, because he don't want to pat himself on the back. He needs us. No, no, no. See, what we don't understand is worship is for us. It's about him, but it's for us. Because, see, we get so wrapped up and we get so enclosed in our little shell, our little world, and we, get so, we can't see the forest for the trees, you know. We can't see beyond here. But the thing is, is, and so God can't actually penetrate that because our minds are so focused on our issues. But when we begin to worship God, when we start turning our focus to him, away from us, and we start... Uh, you know, adoring Him, we start extolling Him, we start, uh, you know, lifting Him up, we start, you know, making Him big in, in our sight, making Him bigger than everything else in our sight. When we start doing that, magnifying Him, the Scripture says, yes. when we start doing that, all of a sudden we've, we've opened up a place in our little bubble, and God actually has access then to get yes. reach down into our lives yes. and touch us and yes. make yes. things happen in our lives, touch us physically, touch us emotionally touch our lives, can affect our lives because we've, we've opened ourselves up to Him through worship. I mean, you can't tell somebody how good they are without creating a connection, you know? Uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, I forgot to tell everybody, Brent, 
Brandon's here, in case y'all didn't know. If y'all don't know Brandon, y'all need to know Brandon. Brandon LaDonna, Captain Rex. But if Brandon's that way. Brandon, I'll, you know, I'll talk to him and I'll say, man, you know, just kind of tell him how good, you know, what they did was good, and blah, blah, blah. Well, when you do that, you create a connection with somebody. And so if you, if you then take that connection and you let a, a, a relationship develop, then it, it can be beneficial. And I'll tell on myself before I dismiss. So when we first moved down here, um, we were doing the South, we we're going to reopen the South Austin church. It had been closed for almost a year or so. It was in bad shape. It was in bad shape bad shape. I mean, it had these four-legged residents that left droppings everywhere and, and you know, all kinds of stuff. And so, uh, Bishop, they, the district decided they would renovate the auditorium and the, and the foyer, and that's pretty much what they were going to do. Well, I was working full-time at the time, and I took the only vacation time I had off to move. And so I told Bishop, I said, listen, because I just assumed he was going to hire somebody to do it. Bishop don't do it that way. But, uh, well, he kind of did hire him, but anyway, not really. <laughs> so anyway, he, uh, so then he had Brand Brandon and his wife in the church pulling up carpet and doing all this other stuff. Well, see, and then I would go home and work. I wouldn't be there to help them work on the church. I told Bishop, I can't because I've got to work. Well, so this is what happens. So Brandon starts telling me about how I need to do the sound system. Well, you start telling me how I do sound system? Oh, wait a minute. I've been doing sound system a lot longer than most people. I mean, I've been doing a long time. Probably not more than any of y'all. I've been doing it almost 40 years I've been doing sound. So Brandon's trying to tell me how to do the sound system. I was a fine arts major in college, and he's telling me about how to do lights and all this stuff. And I specialize in theater tech. So I cop an attitude with Brandon about it, Brandon. I'm thinking, he just... He just doesn't know it all. He just thinks he knows all this other stuff and blah, blah, blah. So I didn't like him. I didn't like, I couldn't stand him. I mean, look at him. He's a punk. You know, got a ponytail and all this kind of stuff. You know what happens. So I just, so I don't know. I mean, what, a year? Did a year go by? So he was sitting in the office, district office, and uh, he and his wife, uh, she was, used to be our district youth director. And so Sharon's got the, the front office there, and it's got a little conference table. So he was sitting there one day, and the Holy Spirit started dealing with me. He said, you need to repent to him. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> you know, and I tried to, I was kind, and I was all this kind of stuff, and I even went to one of their little gigs they did, one of their things, went to the campgrounds that they did a camp and all this other stuff. And they're, you know, I, I admired, they were good, they were good and stuff like that. But, you know, when you got an attitude about somebody, they can't do everything right, you know. They, <laughs> so the Holy Spirit started dealing with me. He said, you need to ask him to forgive you, and you need to confess to what you did, what you said. And I'm thinking, all right. He tried to tell me how to run sound. Trying to tell me how to do lights. So I said, all right. So I thank God I've matured enough to start doing this kind of stuff. And so I said, Brandon, I, I need to tell you something. He said, what's that? I said, I need to ask you to forgive me. And I started telling him what the story and he says, well, you've got to understand, I didn't want to be there, and the pastor that's supposed to be there wasn't staying there and helping us. So I didn't want to be doing it anyway. So I didn't like you either. He didn't say that. Sharon just said that. Sharon just said that. So there was this whole thing that the enemy had done and caused us, and so I just told him, I said, man, I need you to forgive me. Now, I didn't know if, if he's going to say, okay, fine, that's good. Then leave, go on. But at that point, God created a connection between Brandon and I. And, we, and the thing is, is we found out we are so similar, it's scary. We are so similar. We're visionaries. We're, I mean, we're dreamers. We're planners. We're schemers. We're strategizers. We're, I mean, we get together and we just start dreaming. And it's like uh, Jeremiah, any of y'all that saw the post from yesterday, my friend from South Africa was here visiting yesterday and came by. We're the same way. We just sit and dream. And we began to create a connection because we began to see each other's good points. We began to see the good things in each other. When you're worshiping God and telling Him how good He is, and you're worshiping God and you're saying you're awesome, and, oh, you know, 
I just adore you. You create a connection, a relationship with God that he then has access to you and it develops something that you never could have done with just saying your now I lay me down to sleep prayers. When you worship, you're, you're connecting with him and in a way that you can't connect with him any other way. That's why worship is so powerful. It, I mean, not just at church, but, but really at church, in the corporate setting, worship is very powerful. It's not just a bunch of musicians up there picking. That's not what it's about. It's about worshiping. It's about bringing the presence of God. I'll tell you this one last thing before I dismiss. I was leading worship. I think I even I may have told it here. I don't know. But I was leading worship at my dad's church that he and I had started back uh, in 2001. And I was the worship leader because mom didn't want to be the worship leader. Sharon sang too long to be, low to be the worship leader, so I sang blah, blah, blah. So I was leading worship, and, and I was praying one day before, as I was trying to prepare for Sunday. And he said, he said, let me tell you what your job is. And I said, okay. He says, your job is to go to the door of the throne room and lead them to the door of the throne. And then you open the door and let them go in. You don't go in, you don't get lost. I've seen worship leaders get up there and just get lost. And that's, that's okay, but that's not what God told, God told me. You are to go to the door, show them how to get there, and then you open the door and let them in. Let them experience the presence of God. You get yours in your private time. In the corporate time, you are to lead them to that place and open. He said, no, you'll get the breeze. You'll get some of that glory that's coming out. You'll get to experience that, but you don't get to go in right then. Your job as a worship leader is to show them how to get there, and then give them access. And so worship is a key that, that God wants to do. And I don't know how I got on a teaching of worship with, with Corinthians. But anyway, so uh, worship is so key. So God wants us to, to connect with Him. We want to connect with God through worship. All right? So next week, we're going to get into the first chapter. We're just going to start reading Scripture, and then we'll comment. We'll make notes. We'll do like that. Um, I just really feel like this is something that's going to be pivotal in our lives. This is going to do something. I just felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to do this teaching here because He wanted to establish something. 